My name is Victoria Mosenko. I moved nice to, to America. Meet you. Nice to meet you too. I moved to America when I was a year and five months, so I've been here for quite a while. Um, from Kazakhstan, actually. Well, I came to America about 10 years ago. Okay. So, since uh, my grandparents, they got here before and they were, um, it's funny how like the whole story started. My mom came to God in Russia and um, she would constantly tell them about like when she first converted, um, my grandparents thought she was crazy. Like, they're just like, they're, that's a cult, you know, they're gonna, they're like killing people. <laughs> and, my, and my mom was like, what are you talking about? So they basically said like, you're not my daughter. Like they were completely against it. And then they come here, and they're on Brighton Beach, and somebody just comes up to them and just gives them a pamphlet, you know, like, come to our church, and it's Beth Shalom. And she's like, you know what, why not? And she ended up going, and then she accepted Jesus into her heart. And when we came here, so there was already a church set up for us, you know, so I've been going here for the past, for 10 years, yes. Yeah, when I was five years old, somebody approached my mother on the street of Brighton Beach, the infamous Brighton Beach, mm -hmm. um, and mentioned Beth Russia Shalom, time. right? <laughs> and she didn't really understand why, because Beth Shalom it's a Jewish name, and we're Russian, and our parents, you know, back back in Russia, they were um, Russian Orthodox, and in their perspective, anyone who goes to any church other than a Russian Orthodox church is considered part of a sect, so or it's something like demonic or satanic. So that was the first impression, and actually, my mom's sister, my aunt, was the one who discovered this faith first back in Kazakhstan. And uh, when she was telling our family about this, obviously nobody really understood. But then there come a, came a point in, in uh, the lives of, of uh, my family members where they came to receive Christ. Uh, your church has, the, you know, the, it's very unique because it's a one Christian church I've been to that has the Star of Israel. Right. So Beth Shalom Church, who they targeting specifically? The Jews, the okay. major mission because that's what's called Beth Shalom House of Peace. We have a great heart, especially for for Israel, because that's the mission that we have to go and spread the gospel to the chosen nation. Jews and Hasidic Jews. Well, uh, or, yes, or. any Russian Jews, whatever, just to bring them to bring them the truth, because Jesus was Jewish, you know, and he was the only one who was a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God at exactly the same time. Many churches do blame the Jews for bringing, you know, for crucifying Jesus, but if we we all would do that, you know, we would all bash him. A week before that, we, they were praising him, you know, when he was walking down the donkey, and a week after they were saying you know, crucify him. Yeah. That's exactly how we are, our sinful flesh, and yet He forgives us constantly, over and over and over. Like, speak a little bit about your church perspective on, like, you know, Americans or different kind of people. Do you, how do you feel about that? I believe that our church is going to be an international church, international, completely. Right now, mostly there's mostly Russian-speaking people, and but we've seen over the last couple of years that. There's, there's a couple of Puerto Ricans in our church, there's a couple of Italians, there's a couple of dark-skinned people, and I know that there's going to be more of that, and this is what I pray for.
celebrating with the kids that God gave us a harvest, that He gives us really great things such as food and what, uh, weather and all the blessings that we have, God has given us and this holiday is meant to celebrate that with gratitude, a little bit like Thanksgiving. But the reason we're doing it now is because a lot of the kids out there are celebrating Halloween. And um, the, the problem with Halloween is that it's a, a holiday that celebrates fear. And we don't believe in celebrating fear. The Bible says that um, love overcomes fear. Love is stronger than fear. So instead of celebrating fear, we want to celebrate love. So that's also another part of the celebration where we, we want to give the kids an alternative. So instead of celebrating Halloween, they can celebrate gratitude and God's blessings and love. And, and they could still dress up, as you could tell, and have fun, you know.
yes, there, there is a connection there. We do believe that Israel has a specific place in the purposes of God. We also, the connection is obviously that uh, I would say uh, 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 at least 50%, I would say, of our congregants, of, of, of the members of the church are from the Jewish background, such as myself. And uh, there is obviously a, a, a huge connection there. Uh, but uh, uh, we believe that it is our, it's God's mandate uh, given to us as a church, not just a local uh, body of believers, but as a church in general of which we are uh, uh, a part of, uh, to stand with Israel. In what way to stand? Not just socially help Israel, not just send money uh, for social programs per se, but uh, stand with Israel. We believe that the gospel is to the Jew first. We believe that they are to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we also believe by what, what, what I mean when I, said, when I say stand with Israel, that uh, Israel has still yet to be revealed, if I can say, in, a, in all of what God has determined for it to be. And uh, still didn't yet ever reach that peak of glory that is, it's yet to reach in the future, in the near future, we believe. So that's why, that's what it means, what I mean when we, when we say that we stand with, with Israel, we have the star of David, we pray for Jewish people. We pray for them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. It is their Messiah first and foremost, and then everybody else's. Yeah, it, 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 it sort of, uh, it has been switched over the time where people not of Jewish background feel that Jesus is for the Gentiles but the Jews are sort of like a different entity, different unit in Torah. We, it's not true, it's not biblical. In fact, God never made a covenant with the, with the church. He made a covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that when I will make a new covenant. New covenant, New Testament, with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Not the one that I made with them when I took them by the hand and led them from the land of Egypt, the land of oppression. That covenant that I gave to their fathers, they did not keep. But this is the covenant that I will make with them. I will write my laws in their hearts and so forth and so on. So, the New Testament it is a Jewish book. The, the New Covenant made with Jews and with the, with, with, with the house of Israel, the Gentiles are sort of grafted into this whole thing. So we need to realize it. It's not to elevate the Jewishness of it all. No, it's Jesus. It's all about Him. He is the Messiah. But we do realize that Jewish people have a special place in the heart of God and we want to carry that love, that message, the gospel message, the message of hope, for to the Jewish people. Well, I started attending this church when I was five years old, and up until 17, I was in uh, the dance ministry, in the worship team, in the youth group, the, the kids ministry, so it was kind of a lot all at once. And I did have a relationship with Christ at that point, but I didn't know anything else. And I found myself feeling like the prodigal son, where I was looking out of the window at the world and it all seemed so glamorous and I didn't experience any of it and I kind of wanted, I wanted to get a glimpse of what that was. When I was 17 years old, this was senior year of high school, I discovered a new group of friends. And in the world's eyes, they were just normal people who, you know, every once in a while they go out, drink a little here, you know, smoke a little there, you know, party a little bit over here, be a little bit promiscuous. And uh, I kind of had uh, felt and uh, saw myself falling into that. And before I knew it, I went really deep, really fast, and um, several relationships down the road, 
you know, my heart being broken several times and uh, kind of got into drugs and um, started drinking heavily and partying a lot. And I didn't understand why I was facing all the consequences at that point, because that's when it happened. All my other friends were doing the same exact things, yet nothing was happening to them. So as a result, I completely pushed God out of my life. Completely. I was like, you know what? I'm good. Like, I can't deal with this guilt. So I went completely into it, and I was the person who was persuading others to do the drugs at that point. Mm. And um, I was peer pressuring others. So it started off with weed, and then it led into other drugs. And then suicidal thoughts started coming in right here. But mm. I knew that I would never do anything to myself because I was taught that if you lay hands on yourself, you're going straight to hell. So out of fear, I knew that nothing would happen, but those thoughts were so intense that I couldn't really, I didn't know what to do. And I felt like the walls were closing in, as cliche as that sounds, but that's exactly what it was. I mean, I came, since we moved to America, we started going to Bet Shalom. I stepped away for four years. I mean, I went to church even though with my faith from six years old, you know. I, I thought I knew God personally. Like, I would talk to him, my mom would even, like, bring up stories, like, every night. I'm like, I'm sorry, I yelled at my mom, praying, crying. I was very passionate about it, but I guess when, you know, you came here, and America is a lot different from Russia. Like, in Russia, it's a lot more strict, you know. Mm. And especially when I got to high school, peer pressure, you know, and step by step, you know. It all, it starts with a little step, you know, music here, and I remember, after school, my friends were offering just, just try a cigarette. I never tried it before. Everyone is already smoking. Mm -hmm. Just try it. And I knew it. I knew that was going to be that one step that, you know, that's going to push me away. I knew, but yet I still did it. So I went through the whole stage smoking, drugs, you know, pot. Pot had for two years every single day. Like, mm -hmm. I, I didn't go to school for two years. Mm. I would have my friends, you know, mark me off as present, but I yeah, yeah, went to school <laughs> they started making phone calls and my mom's like, you haven't been to school for two years. Basically, you know, whole partying scene every weekend, you know, I had to lie and everything. And my senior year, that's when it hit me, depression, because it's the same thing. Party scene is the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Take it. Definitely. It Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. Um, I had a best friend from freshman year and we I consider her my sister and it's funny how it says you know like if God's not first in your life then something or someone else will be and that's exactly what she was she became my idol she knew all my secrets she knew, literally put out my heart and she stabbed it so um that yeah. brought you closer to help well that basically directly. pushed me off the cliff <laughs> I became even more depressed. I would sleep for 15 hours every single day. Work, school, and sleep because that would... The reason why I would sleep for so many hours is because I had the thoughts of suicide, committing suicide. Literally, I would feel like the enemy was right here. Just jump out, jump out, jump out the window. Mm. So many moments I would open up the window and I would literally just stare down. Literally, so close to jumping. And one night, I was, I'm like, I'm going to do it. There's no point of living. I'm going to do it. And I just get this thought. Look over to your desk. I look over to my desk and there's a yellow book. And, I'm, and it's like this thought, just go pick it up. And I, I don't read. I mean, I skipped school for two years, but the, the reading was the last thing, you know, last resort. I go pick up this book. It's called Heaven is for Real. And I start reading it. And basically it's, uh, I guess, a documentary about a boy who died, I don't know if you ever like heard those stories of when they die, they leave their body and come back to life. He was, you know, three years old and basically he had this whole uh, experience and when he came back to life, he didn't just sit down, oh daddy, I went to heaven and I saw this, this, that. No, it was just little, you know, hints here and there and dad's like, what, what's wrong with him? You know, like, there's something wrong with him. Yeah. So they wanted to take him to like a psychologist or something. And then basically, they realized that he had that experience. They had to accept it because he would 
he talked about his little sister, you know, that was never born, you know, so they lost a baby before him, so, and he didn't even know about it, and then he meets his sister there, and basically things like that, but what stood out to me the most, he goes, Daddy, do you understand how much God loves you? He goes, yeah, I'm a pastor, I preach about it every Sunday, he goes, no, 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 you don't understand, he's like, I saw God, he's like, he loves you this much, you know? And by the end of the book, I'm just crying hysterically mm -hmm. because that yeah. moment I realized that the only one that was there for me was God. January 29th of 2012, um, my cousin um, convinced me to go to this different church in, in Manhattan. And a month before that, she experienced uh, Christ in her room by herself. And for that month, she was telling me about God, and I didn't want to hear it. I wanted nothing to do with it because I was like, you know, I've been there, done that, I'm good. But this day, I decided to go with her, just to go. And as I went, I felt like the pastor was speaking to me and only me. There was nobody else in the room. And at the end, I just raised my hand for the altar call, figured why not just flex a muscle, raise my hand. I have nothing to lose, repeated the words, and that's it. But in the back of my mind, I thought, you know what, God, if you're real, I challenged, I challenged God at that point. I said, if you're real, take away these worldly desires from me, especially smoking, because I had no self-control. I couldn't do it on my own. And when I went outside and I had the choice to light up that cigarette or not, I already was about to light it. And I'm like, you know what, this time, let me just hold off. And I smelled the smell of tobacco next to me. Somebody was smoking and I was so nauseated by the smell that I was, I almost vomited from it. Whereas I themed it a couple minutes before that. And um, I understood that was that was God, and that was His answer to my prayer, which was somewhere in my subconscious. And that night, I just was worshiping Him till four or five in the morning, any way I could. I didn't even know how at that point because I completely forgot it. Because for four years before that, I was just wandering in the world. And then little by little, I started experiencing Him more in my life. I didn't really understand certain things that maybe were were spoken about at the church. I didn't understand certain things that people were doing but I had that desire to please him I had the desire to completely change my life and before I knew it the cursing stopped the drugs stopped and there were some things that happened instantly like smoking for example that completely just went away the only time I was tempted to do that is when I was drinking so then the drinking stopped and there were certain things that took a little bit longer for example um, the view on premarital sex. People have different view, views on it, even in the church, unfortunately. But I'm not ashamed to say it, but, you know, there were mistakes in the past before before I got saved. And so is it abstinent now? Yeah, completely. I'm married to Christ, and you know what? I feel like a virgin. I really do. And I even believe that on the first night of my wedding night that it's going to be evident, if you know what I mean. How has your life changed since you, um, since your conversion? Dramatically. That moment, I just experienced the most ultimate joy. I've never experienced it with drugs, with uh, uh, alcohol, nothing. My life changed 100%. It changed drastically. There's, there's joy in my heart. There's absolutely no fear. There's just hope for tomorrow. Whereas before Christ, I did not see a future for myself. Many times I share it to people about my experience and they watch you and they get inspired by it. But until you have your own experience with him, it will never change your life, you know. But it will only happen when you ask him to come into your life. Because before that night, I realized a month before that, I asked him, I was so depressed, I'm like, God, if you're real, please save me from this. And a month later, that happened to me. So until we ask, it says that in the Bible, and you know, he knocks until you open the door. But he will never enter in. He's a gentleman, you know. You'll never barge in and be like, this is my place and you're going to follow me and you have no say in it. That's why he gave us the will of choice, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have to make that choice and ask him to come into our hearts and to transform us. And that usually happens when we're on the ground, you know, <laughs> fallen deep down. When it, like when it comes to suicide, like say someone commits suicide just because they've been bullied or they like someone is treating them terrible, being raped or something crazy going on, they just I can't take this no more. I gotta go. Boom. What about them? Do they go to hell too? That's for God to decide. Because like decide. they feel like so miserable, 
If you like, like they I they not doing nothing to anyone, but they being tortured and right. feel miserable. What about them that can just do they do they also? Go? What I can say is what it says in the Bible. God gave you life, right? You have absolutely no right to do anything to it. He gave it to you, only he can take it away. But oftentimes God calls out to us, but we don't we think we don't hear his voice. We think it's our own inner voice or, or something else. It's very low. But in fact, it's God. It's yeah, very sometimes low. it's low, but sometimes it's loud, but we kind of mislead it as other things. And um, unfortunately, the enemy, you know, has strength also because he's the God of this world currently. You know, when, 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 when Christ was reigning, when he was here on earth, and, and they wanted to exalt him, he said, now is not the time because I'm not the God of, of this kingdom. You know, he's, he's the God of the kingdom that, that, that's in heaven, the one that we are going to get to one day. So, and unfortunately, the enemy is having his way here, and he's pushing these thoughts on people, and, you know, sometimes it happens, but I'm not to say where, where they're going to go. I'm just going to say what it, says, what it says in the Word. You know, God gives you life, and you have no right to take it away. My message is that there is hope. You just got to hear it, because like I said, God speaks, but sometimes we mistake that voice for somebody else's voice. But if you really listen closely, you'll hear his voice. And his voice is hope. His voice is love. And I believe that whatever you're going through, if you feel like there's absolutely no purpose and absolutely no hope for tomorrow, that there is. You just got to open your ears, open your eyes to it. And he's going to show you what that is. And that's Jesus Christ. The way I remember the first time I physically like experienced them was my mom actually shared it today with the kids how um, I was very sick, you know, like fever, high fever, like coughing, you know, everything. And my grandma's like, You're not going to church because every Sunday and back in Russia it's really cold. Like you would have to put on cold volume in Russian, but it, um it's not Uggs. Yes. Like it's, it's like snow. <laughs> you got serious out there. Seriously, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like and, coats over coats so my grandma's like there's no way you're, you're gonna get even more sick you know even if i dress you up like a you know a tomato but she's like you're still gonna get sick so i'm like no i'm gonna go because i'm gonna get healed and she's looking at me she's like i can't believe you what am i supposed to say to a child so she took me and she went to church she left me at sunday school and when she was picking me up i was running to her and she, she literally had tears in her eyes because I was healed. I was completely healed because of my faith. You know, I had that faith and it says, you know, by your faith you will be healed. And that's exactly it. How old were you at that time? I was around six. Six? Oh. So you had the faith since six. That's cool. That's yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I got water baptized at 13 years old. And many people thought I had no idea what I was doing because I was so young. But... I knew exactly what I was doing because I felt God's presence so much, so tangibly, especially that day. We were out on Brighton Beach and um, it was my turn to go into the ocean and get baptized. And as soon as that happened, there was a huge cross in the sky, like out of the clouds, just a huge cross and everybody noticed it. And that was just kind of like evident and a confirmation that God was just like, I'm real, here I am. You're doing the right thing.